Thanks, Anna. I'm sorry I made you read out this title because it's now much shorter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the subjective cost of young children, a European comparison, which is joint work with Angela Groenig and Bernhard Hammer, as you've already said. What we're trying to do in this paper is to come up with estimates for the cost of children based on the subjective economic well-being of their parents. So we will not come up with a monetary measure, it's basically an estimate. And why do we think that this is relevant? Well, there is some evidence out there that the cost of children not only influences fertility decisions, but also labor market decisions. So what do I mean when I talk about subjective economic well-being? We are working with EU silk data, panel data, and there is a question in the database where the household respondent is asked, are you able to make ends meet? Or depending on the question, are you able to uh, pay for your usual necessary expenses? And the household respondent is then able to answer this question based on a Likert scale from very easily to with great difficulty. When you look at how subjective economic well-being changes around the birth of a child, you see a clear drop. The graph here is for first-time parents only. We will later also talk about um, more children. And this is based on panel data, so we can actually observe the same parents before and after the child is born. You see on the x-axis the years before and after the child is born, and we see a drop. We interpret this drop in subjective economic well-being as the total net cost of children, the subjective total net cost of children as parents perceive it. But we don't really know what causes this drop, right? There are several channels uh, which could be the main cause for this. First of all, there are direct costs, which can be anything from moving into a bigger apartment once your child is born, spending more money on food, heating or diapers, maybe getting a bigger car. Then there is also the indirect costs of children, which are opportunity costs, which occur when one or both parents work less or stop working entirely once their child is born. And then there are benefits, which are a compensating factor. They compensate for the direct and indirect costs of children, and they vary a lot depending on the region that you live in. So what we want to know is, how do children affect the subjective economic well-being of parents? And how do direct and indirect costs contribute to the change in subjective economic well-being? We then want to know if the direct and indirect costs vary by European region and how well governments or maybe households themselves do in compensating for these costs. So the data that we work with is EU silk panel data, which we have for almost a, over 125,000 households from 2004 to 2015. We only analyze couples that live without any additional adults, so there's no other income component um, messed with our estimates. We can follow couples for a maximum of four years. And here comes the first limitation. We can only make conclusions about very young children. So we cannot make any um, long-term estimates about the cost of children. And we, only, we have restricted our sample to women between the age of 16 and 40 and men 16 and older. Because we have 30 countries in our sample, and sorry I didn't mention that the very first graph was simply based on the pooled sample of 30 European countries, um, we wanted to make it more comprehensible. So we've um, clustered them into six groups based on um, factors that impact the direct and indirect cost to children. And the six groups that we have come up with are Nordic countries, Western European countries, German speaking countries, not including Germany because they did not provide data liberal countries, southern European countries, and central and eastern European countries, which is by far the most heterogeneous group in there. Here comes the first cost component, where we can clearly see how different um, they are by region. What you see here is the employment pattern of first-time mothers. So these graphs are similar to the one that you've seen at the very beginning. On the x-axis, you have the years before and after a child is born. And then you see the share of women in active employment before and after they have their first child. And we see that the patterns are very different. Look at German-speaking countries or Central and Eastern European countries. Do I have a...? No, but you can read that. Um, where we see a clear drop 
in the employment and we also see no recovery. Whereas in Nordic countries and liberal countries we see a small drop but some recovery. Western European countries that include France, we hardly see a drop. That being said, women in maternity leave, they are considered as being in employment, whereas women in parental leave, they are considered as being inactive or not being in employment. The consequence, I know this is a lot of numbers, but I will guide you through it. The consequence of this employment pattern is that look at the labor income of women in the year before and after they had their first child. So minus one is the year before, one is the year after, and I've set it to 100% of the year before. So we can see a clear drop for the average woman. We don't know how this looks along the income distribution, but on average we can make this conclusion. And the drop is particularly big in German-speaking countries or in Central and Eastern European countries where women tend to leave the labor market at least for the first couple of years. Surprisingly though, household incomes is almost constant. There's not much of a change. Why is that? Well, first of all, men earn slightly more after the child is born, and this is um, controlled for or adjusted for inflation. And benefits, family-related benefits, increase. So what we want to know, what we, what we do now, or what we did, is we wanted to estimate the effect of children on subjective economic well-being. We want to have a, we want to quantify this effect, and we do that by. Um, setting up a model in which we estimate the effect of the number of children on subjective economic well-being. But beware, now we're not only looking at the first birth, we're looking at every additional birth too. And we control for variables which we think might impact the subjective economic well-being, such as age or health, but we're not really interested in that. We just want to know the effect of children on subjective economic well-being. We run several regressions here, including income or not, so that we are able to disentangle the direct from the indirect costs. And I'm sorry, I don't have more time to talk about this today. If you're interested in details, you can maybe do it in discussions or later. But what we're doing is by running th three different models for each of the regions, we are able to get an estimate for the total cost of children, the direct cost of children, and the indirect cost of children. The estimation methods we use is simple OLS. But because you could interpret our dependent variable as an ordered variable, because it is answered on a Likert scale from 1 to 6, we're also doing a sensitivity analysis where we apply a nonlinear method, the so-called blow-up and cluster method, which is basically a conditional logic estimation. And here come our results. So the way you have to interpret them is as an effect, so the effect of children on subjective economic well-being. On the very first column, you see the total cost of children, depending on the region. In the second column, you see the direct costs, and in the last column, the indirect costs. The take-home message here is, first of all, the total cost and also the direct costs are highest in high-income countries. Surprise. Secondly, we see that the direct costs make most of the subjective total costs. So it seems as if when it comes to the subjective total cost of children, the direct costs are much more important than the indirect cost. Finally, we see that in the, th in the three countries where we saw a substantial drop in the employment of women after the birth, <laughs> these are also the regions where we have the highest indirect costs. That's the Nordic countries, the German-speaking countries, and the Central and Eastern European countries. The reason why you don't see any results for liberal countries here is because our results weren't significant, so we weren't able to decompose the total cost of children. So, to conclude, the birth of the children does reduce subjective economic well-being. We do find economies of scale for most of the regions, meaning that the first child is the costliest and each additional child has a lower subjective cost for its parents. The direct costs do definitely drop the subjective economic well-being, examples being again buying a bigger car or moving into a bigger house. And the indirect costs are relatively small. And also, 
And that's not result I showed here, but we decomposed this even further, so we were able to detect that uh, the indirect costs are mostly compensated for by other income components, such as by the income of the father or by benefits. This study does not come without limitations. One big one is that we cannot control for a change in expectation, for a change in general well-being. So if that changes with the birth of a child, then we are ignorant to that. We can also not analyze the long-term costs of children. Here we found that the indirect costs are very small. But when you think about the gender wage gap, the medical wage uh, penalty, or differences in the pension between women and men, that's something that doesn't appear in the first three years after a child is born. So that's something we cannot analyze here. And then finally, we did find some evidence for self-selection into parenthood. So if the couples that expect a significant drop in their subjective <coughs> economic well-being decide to not have children in the first place, then that's something that biases our estimates. Okay, so if you have any questions, let me know.